This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Well, here we are navigating the journey on a given Wednesday with Marcia Joyner. I'm Jay Fidel to 12 o'clock block. And we're going to talk about the story of Dory, uh, Dory Miller, a grateful nation, question mark. Yeah. He was a fantastic hero. Not enough has been made of that. You've studied it for years, <laughs> years You've written and years about it. And years. You have done all you could do, but there's more that you could do so, um, to bring it to yeah. the public eye. So, who is Dory Miller? Dory Miller is, let's see if we can show this picture. This is Dory Miller, and he was originally Doris. But of course, D O R I S. R -I -S. Yes. Great big strapping with, with guy, Di Doris. Doris, yeah. Uh, that was when he was born. The midwife gave him that name. And he was born on a farm, because his family were farmers, in Waco, Texas. So, of course, you had midwives and whatnot. He would have been uh, born in the, in the 20s. The, in the Depression, yeah. And uh, so, this story about Dory, and, and I say, let me say, I have a story to tell you. Yeah, there he is. One pulled that's out, Dory. That's Dory. One pulled out of an old trunk, from the corners of my memory, from the hidden annals of Americana, from the dirt swept under the rug, from the back roads of history. And this is one of those stories. On so he's a hero. He's a hero. He's a big, strapping black guy from Waco, Texas. Texas. He's in the United States Navy at the time of Pearl Harbor, and that distinguishes and defines him, what happened on December 7th. So he chose, cho chose to join the Navy, even though he knew it was segregated. But he says, and I quote, it beats uh, sitting on the curb in Waco, Texas. So they, he joins the Navy. He's stationed at West on the West Virginia, and in, in at March Pearl Harbor. and March it was the battleship. It, the battleship, one of the battleships. He was moved. The battleship was moved from California to Hawaii, and this is getting ready for war. Now, we'll jump around, but the Americans spent one billion with a B in the 1930s, getting Honolulu ready for war with That's a lot Japan. of bread in the 1930s. It was. Honolulu did not experience the Depression like everybody else did because Uncle Sam was busy building. They put in the tunnels. They put in the Red Hill, all that stuff that we're complaining about today, getting ready for war with Japan. So, you know, we've been, we've been raised with the notion that Pearl Harbor was a sneak attack. But now you're talking about getting ready for war, so maybe it wasn't so much a sneak attack. And I saw that you brought some headlines with I you. I did. From the days before Pearl Harbor. Let's see if we can. Where the local newspapers here in Hawaii Nei had headlines. Headlines, Reporting yes. that war was imminent, an attack was imminent. And That's not was, a sneak attack. This was the week before. Yeah. This was the week before, and that is... Read the headline. This one. Uh, the Kiresu bluntly warned nation ready for battle. And that's in the... And this is the Honolulu, Honolulu Advertiser. Advertiser. The week before, it was the week before, November 30, 1941. Okay. Hold, hold it up so we can see, take a look at it. See if, can you get that one yeah. close? Not a very good print, but... But that's, no, it's not. But you can see that's what it is. It's an advertiser headline. Okay, you got another one now. Yes. And this and is the, the Hilo, Hilo Tribune, Tribune Herald. Japan may strike over weekend. 
And this, again, is November 30, 1941. So the notion that it was a surprise attack really fades. <clears throat> in view of these local headlines, they had no great inside information, but somehow they had enough information where two newspapers a few days before, a week before, could, um, you know, prognosticate, could, could tell well, us there was going to be an attack. Well, now think about this. To move all of those ships from Japan across that ocean because they <clears throat> bombed Pearl Harbor, Guam, and another place all at the same time on the same day, even though because of the time zones, it looks different, but they all happened at the same time. Can you imagine moving all those ships and all of those planes and all of those people and to buy enough provisions for all of those ships and nobody knows and you're crossing that huge Pacific Ocean and nobody knows? Come on. Somebody knew. I mean, you know, if, if they did that right here, wouldn't you say, why are they filling up those ships? Why are they buying all of that? You know, somebody, yeah. and there yeah. were spies in those well, days. I think there were political forces at there play. There were spies. Uh, strange diplomacy and espionage going on. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, let me tell you, um, at the time, the Navy was segregated. In fact, it had been segregated since the Revolutionary War up until... Uh, 1948, when Truman integrated the military. But if you can think of all those wars. And so the blacks, at, at one time, they were all Asian as messmen, which as the, a messman is a rate given only to those men who take care of the senior officers. They That's, served the table. They said in, in the, the in the officers' mess. Mess. They That's served a mess. Maybe they cooked too. I don't know. They did everything. They mm. made sure his uniform was perfect. Oh. Oh. They made sure everything that when they weren't at sea, if his wife needed a Christmas present, they you know, everything they took care of the officers. That was the whole idea. So a bit of a royalty of a, thing. Yes, and, and it was a class thing. <laughs> Yeah. It was a race thing. Well, yeah. I mean, but for the officers to be treated this way and not the rest of the Aristocracy. crew. Aristocracy. Yes, not the rest of the crew. So. Something out of the South. Yes, as a matter of fact, when the Navy did choose blacks to come in, they did choose, they said it clearly that they wanted the blacks from the South because they weren't uppity like northern blacks. Northern blacks talk back. The southern blacks were not uppity. So yes, it was exactly as you're saying. Hmm. Okay, well, so Jory Miller was a messman? Yes. And, the and messman, he was on the West Virginia the West battleship. Virginia. He was there at Pearl Harbor. What happened? So, the morning of the bombing, in uh, the early morning, December 7 was on a Sunday. So about 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock. And there the had been a huge officer's party the night before. So everything was late. The bugler was late. Breakfast was late. Everything was late, which is why they were all kind of huddled up and nobody was ready. And so then begins the planes come in and KGU radio is playing. Uh, Glenn Miller, uh, Sunrise Serenade, you know, the whole beautiful Sunday beautiful morning. Beautiful Sunday morning. Gorgeous yeah. Sunday morning. And all of a sudden, uh, here, here this planes come, and they come across the Coley Coley Pass, and they'd already been up at Dillingham Field and all of these places, but now they come into view. And there are a hundred ships that and are all sitting ducks in Pearl Sitting Harbor. ducks. A hundred and fifty ships. hundred and fifty ships. Sitting there. You know. And they begin to pick them off. Well, Dory Miller, they call him up because his captain of the ship had been mortally wounded. And they call him up because he's the biggest man on the ship. 
to move him. And the captain says, no, 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 no. I don't want to be moved. I'm going down with the ship. But the ship was... Oh, the, yeah. There was, was no sinking. question. You know, this was attack coming from everywhere. And I think we do have a picture of the West Virginia as it is blowing up. And there it is. As wow. you can see. Uh, when yeah. you realize how many people were killed that day, you just, this takes on a... A whole secondary And you see meeting. where the boat is in the water there? Mm -hmm. They're trying to pick people out. All of that was oil, and it was burning like you would the fuel all over the ocean. Mm -hmm. Ships going down, the Arizona. Violence uh, everywhere. 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 Murderous, everywhere. lethal yes. violence. So Dory Miller stepped when they said, no, uh, don't move him. He sees a gun torrent that's empty, and he steps up to it and begins to shoot. And he shoots and he shoots and he shoots. Now he had no training. No training. They didn't shoot. Tra they didn't shoot or train these messmen to do this. That was not their job. They weren't to do this. They weren't even to touch the guns. But he did. And years later, when they go through all of this about what happened, his brother said, oh, this guy could shoot the eyes out of a squirrel. There was no <laughs> train, you know, he, he when, saw when what he was, was a kid, he learned how to shoot. Yeah, is it, here's, here's, we're in trouble. He steps up and begins to shoot. And he says, and, and I quote, that uh, they tell me, he didn't say he shot down five, he says they tell me I shot down five planes. So the heart of the story of course, is that he was not recognized. The papers said an unidentified colored messman mm -hmm. shot down the planes. An unidentified colored messman. And so he, he's heard, he's into the ocean, you know, like everybody else in that boiling water. Well, I mean, there's a certain amount of risk to just being behind the machine gun. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I don't know if people realize that during World War II, with the equipment, the weapons they had, the planes, the guns they had, it, things were much closer. It was not an automated war. No. It, you could see the eyes of the person you were right. shooting at. And as those planes were coming down toward him, they yeah, would, they would see him look, shooting. Yeah, they could. And they would try to shoot, shoot him. Back. Yeah. They would try to blow him up. Uh -huh. So this was very risky business, which makes it all the more heroic. Okay, so, and, and that's why, I mean, I'm dwelling on this yeah. because I think we have to take a break and think about this. We're going to take a short break. Okay. We're going to come back, and you're going to try to explain to me why it took years for him to be recognized. You're going to have a hard time with that. <laughs> okay. We'll be right we'll back. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha! I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahei every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii who joins us from time to time to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us every other Monday. Aloha. Uh, okay, so this was really quite remarkable, uh, Marcia, that you know, first of all, you have a black guy who's usually relegated to being a messman. That was his rate. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, in, in the heat of this battle, he takes an active role mm -hmm. with uh, an important piece of, uh, you know, weaponry. And he successfully shoots down these five planes and, take, you know, takes his own life in his hands by doing that. I mean, he could have jumped off earlier. Yeah. He could have well. got off that ship because the ship was under attack. Um, instead, he stuck around. Okay. And the papers caught it, and they talked about an unidentified colored sailor 
Huh? I shot, shot down these planes. Who did this, um, yeah. and that was December 7th, 1941. Okay. So it's quite remarkable. The whole story is quite remarkable. Why did it take so long? It says not, in, not until March 1942. That's a year later? A year later that they identified eyewitnesses, even though the, the captain of his ship, all of the people said he did it, but it wasn't until the Congress said in 1942 that they identified the unknown black messman was Dory Miller. And they really worked and worked and worked um, to uh, get him recognized. So, what does that mean? A medal? What does that mean? Anything. He was alive, you know? Yes, he's alive. He was alive, so uh, this... Uh, and uh, so they, um, unlike the uh, white men that were da hurt that day, and there were hundreds of them, they got leave to go home to get well. He was not. He was sent on another ship to go back to work. Uh, and so the newspapers, the black newspapers, really, so beginning in um, the Wake, his, here, Waco. His hometown. The Dallas Express, 11 April 1942. They tell the story of how an all-Southern Negro Youth Conference met, and they wanted to meet him and how they invited him to see. He was a hero for them. He's a hero for him. And they presented him with a hundred dollar war bond. Can you remember 1942? Oh, that was a lot, a lot of money. That was a lot now. of money. Yeah. And how the children that were at that conference adored meeting a real hero. And he was such a warm, but gentle soul. He was the only story like the this, only. right? There was, no own, there was no other story of a, of a black sailor stepping up, being a hero in in in, in a, a surprise battle. Um, so um, and that's June, quite remarkable. And and you'd think that the the Navy would have made more of it. No, even though they had eyewitnesses, they didn't. Okay, what happened? So the newspaper after newspaper, 1942, 43, they. All of these black newspapers are clamoring to have him recognized. Uh, finally, finally, um, you know, that we, we have a hero, finally. And uh, the newspapers, the clamoring, all of this finally gets to the Navy, and he is awarded the Navy Cross. Now that was a hard one battle, I'm tell you, to get the Navy Cross because the let me find it. What, what year was that? Nineteen forty two. September nineteen forty two. September fifteen, nineteen forty three. Admiral Chester Nimitz personally presented Dory the Navy Cross May twenty second. May 27, 1942, aboard the USS Enterprise. So he was transferred to the Enterprise? No, that's where the ceremony was. But, but, the, but the whole, his, his uh, duty station was here in Honolulu the whole time. They transferred him to another ship. But here? No, Honolulu. 1943, early morning dawn in the vast Pacific Ocean, a periscope broke the surface, locking in on the target. The enemy torpedoed sunk the ship, and in 22 minutes, the Lipscomb Bay is where he was stationed with 54 officers and men, including Dory, went down. Ooh. Ironically, Mr. and Mrs. Miller, his parents, were not notified until December 7, 1943. They didn't even bother to tell his parents. We think that yeah. was special for him, or the, you know, that was it was wartime. It was a submarine. It was operating under some curtain of secrecy. Um, you know, so it was it was a long. It was in terms of communications, it was a long time. Long time, and, and so 
the newspapers did everything in the world. So, on the front page of the Pittsburgh Courier, January 1942, United States, 41 lynchings, 1940. Anyway, in the issue, man gun at Pearl Harbor, NAACP asked the President of the United States to give the unnamed Messman a Distinguished Service Award. And I, I'm just telling you how many newspapers, how many people clamored for well, this. Well, you've done a lot of research and on this, Marsha. We know, have, we have so. worked on this, let me tell you, since somebody, I, I don't know how many years now, said to me, we had this portrait at Pearl Harbor. Who is this guy? Tell us about him. So, you know, my curiosity. So I went out, and here's this beautiful portrait of Dory Miller. We have a picture of him. This one, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the one at Pearl Harbor. So that's when I started doing the research. And why doesn't he have the uh, Medal of Honor? So we started writing to the Navy, following all of the... I interviewed every one of the West Virginia people that were still alive. And we wrote... When was it, this? When, when were you writing? 1970... What is it? 70s. In the 70s, okay. Yeah. In the 80s, we started this whole thing. We did. Now, the newspapers had been doing it all along. Across the country, books, written articles, everything written about him. I even asked Senator Inouye. He joined with me, and he wrote a letter to the Department of the Navy to give him a Medal of Honor. No. They, they turned it down. Said, well, we need eyewitnesses, and everybody's dead. Can't have a Medal of Honor without eyewitness. They made excuses to the senator, right? We kept writing and kept writing all across the country. People stayed with it until now. And we keep saying, they said, well, you know, we've gotten more requests for him than anybody else in history. Uh, and they kept, the last letter I got from them, they said, if you could give us new information. What, what's new? What's new? There's nothing new. What's new? <clears throat> We've I, given I you. I really saying they wanted more information that wasn't yeah. enough yet. But That's anyway, so did you ultimately prevail on this? No, we still haven't. You still haven't? No. Even with Dan and Oway's help? You even still with Dan and Oway's help, with, uh, even so, up to Obama, they would not, the Department of the Navy would not give. Did they say why? They, no, they just said no. What's the standard for a, uh, a Medal of Honor? Oh, well, right now they say you have to have eyewitnesses. Well. But what, what sort of conduct, though, oh, entitles somebody to a Medal of Honor? When you do something, you sacrifice yourself for someone, for the other troops. The latest one, he took, um, it, it was an incredible process that he went through to save his troops, you know. Um, and died in the process. No, he, he lived. You don't have to die to get You don't have to honor. die, no. Uh, even Mueller did not get an award. He got a bronze star. He saved, when he was a lieutenant in the Vietnam, he saved all of his troops. His troops are writing about it, but no, he didn't get anything either. Hmm. So. Well, it's very rare. It is. It is. Uh, but that we haven't given up. There, uh, that was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> there are, in Waco, there's a beautiful sculpture. And here in Honolulu, there's a Navy housing named for Dory Miller. All across the country, there are all kinds of tributes, and people just love the story. If you watch the movie Pearl Harbor, Dory, uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. plays the part of Dory Miller. Needless to say, when they were filming, I objected. I was at Pearl Harbor the, during the whole filming. I objected because Go uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., while he's a great star, he's not big. 
the whole story of Dory Miller, the reason he was called up on deck, he was the one to save his captain. He was the one, because he was the biggest man on the ship. So visually, it tells you a story. Mm. Yeah. But they, they didn't listen to me, obviously. Is this, <laughs> is this, is this unique, this story? Um, I mean, did, did other situations like this happen in World War II where I am uh, certain. black yes. servicemen yes. Uh, performed acts of great bravery? Yes. Uh, worthy of medals, and they didn't get medals. I mean, yes, just, yes, where, yes. Where can I read up on this? Uh, where can I find out? What organizations follow this? What organizations are advocating for their their families and their How memories? How many? The, oh, there are so many here. Um, even in Guam, they didn't. Uh, it's, he says in Guam uh, about the Chamorros and the Filipinos. He says. He felt like in America that he was a criminal for something he didn't do mm. just because of the racism, mm. the way they were treated. Um, there is another one, and da -da 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 -da. let me find his name. No need, no need, Marshall. But he I, was, want, I want to just know that there were others. There uh, were uh, others, and his name, so, uh, where, William Jeremiah Powell, mm -hmm. was on the Curtis. And he, again, a messman, and he sits on the back of the Curtis and shoots down the plane, and the plane crashes. But he's, and again, it was the white men on the ship that told the story of what he did. And I went digging for him, of course. But there are so many of these stories that go untold, so many. So what's the point? What's the point of your, your research? What's the point, what is, what is your feeling now? What would you like to leave with the audience about all of this? We still haven't given up, of course. Uh, there are so many men of every color who go unrecognized uh, for what they do, for what they did. Since uh, 1774 until today, America has only been at war, has been at war every year, though, except 14, 14 years. Not con, con, 14, but you add a year here, a year here, a year, that adds up to 14 years. When you think of all of the lives, all of the people that have sacrificed for this country, and how many of them go unrecognized, how many of them, how many, if you ask now, to ask your audience, because Hawaii had, you know, Hawaiians and Filipinos and Chamorros, how many of them went unrecognized? I would bet you that we would get a huge number of them, because mm. they were all drafted, and they went all in this, in this war, World War II, because of the draft, and even Vietnam, I mean Korea because of the draft. How many of them go unrecognized? Well, I think um, it, it goes wider than that in the sense that in this country, um, people don't necessarily appreciate what uh, fighting men, people in the military do for us. Um, and that, I think that's especially so. Well, well, clearly it was especially so in Vietnam. Oh my, <clears throat> yes. And I think it's so now. Uh, especially with a volunteer uh, army. And so what, what you have is uh, a lack of, of interest, really, on recognizing in the civilian community. And we need, to, we need to work on that. We need to appreciate them more. I think because now my great-great-grandfather was uh, Civil War General John Bell Hood. Yeah, if you can imagine that. And... And, and he was on the other side. He, he's a Confederate general. Confederate general. The one okay. the, the base is named after? Well, that's... You have a statue of him in the house? No, but my maiden name is Hood. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we don't talk about him. But um, when you come from a family that has years and years, and all of those years of drafts, you feel you, you, it's part of who you are. 
now that we don't have a draft, people don't participate. They don't care about the war. Once, once we were through with the draft, it was only when it's your family that you care. Yeah, well, we got to get over that. I never thought that uh, terminating the draft was a good idea anyway, because I think that people do, should do national service. That's the best way. It's, the, it's a clear way. Um, and, and we have to have a connection between the citizen and the government. And that's um, it's really too bad that these days we don't have much of a connection between the citizen and the government. You pay your taxes, uh, you avoid doing federal crimes, <laughs> and, and that's about it. Um, we should all feel part of the government. They are us, we are them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think this goes, including uh, Dory Miller. We are him, he is us. Mm -hmm. He's part of the greatest generation yes. that won that war. Now, there's one little thing, and I put it, the Jews and the Catholics didn't do much better than the blacks. In the biography of Admiral Hyman Rickover, he says, Jewish midshipmen were sent to Coventry. This is at the Naval Academy. Were sent to Coventry for all the four years at the Naval Academy, no midshipman could speak to Rickover. No one acknowledged his existence. The idea of Coventry seems to have begun around the time of the Civil War between Charles I and Parliament. Royalist prisoners were sent to Coventry for, uh, the, for their support of the Parliament. Another theory holds that townspeople of Coventry so disliked having troops quartered that they were ostracized. Well, that's too bad. It's yes. a, Coventry is a bad place to go. It's an ostrac yes. ostracization. Um, and uh, if it's based on race or religion, now, it's On really, the Jews. If it's based the, on race or religion, it's very offensive. Yes. We're out of time, Marcia. I uh, really appreciate this discussion with you. I think you ought to carry it on. Uh, you know so much. You've read so much. You've written so much. <laughs> Uh, this is not something that you should um, that should let slide under the waves. No, we don't. But uh, because it was December seventh, we had to share it. Perfectly appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Always, Marcia Joyner. And we'll see matters. you next time. <laughs>